This morning's first reading is Luke 1, verses 26 through 45. Listen to the word of God. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed, to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived the son, and this is the sixth month, and with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why this is granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading continues in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. She'll be reading verses 46 through 56. Again, found on page 804 in your pew Bibles. And again, let's listen to the word of God. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of this, his holy word. Well, most of you know that I love history. In fact, history was my primary major in college. But you may not realize that one of the reasons I love studying history so much, and in particular why I love reading biographies, is because you're reading about things that really happened and things that really happened to real people. And I love when those people come alive in my mind. I love trying to put myself in their place and trying to figure out what they went through, what they, what they were thinking, what they were feeling, what I might have done if I had been in their place. 
And that's what we're going to try to do a little bit today as we look at the two women in this little piece of the nativity story that we don't often look at. We're going to specifically look at the humility of Elizabeth and the humility of Mary and at how both of these women magnified not themselves, but the Lord. And so we're going to start with Elizabeth. Again, a character in the nativity story that is so often overlooked. You might remember from your Sunday school days that Elizabeth, in her old age, or at least old age for that time, she was well past the time of menopause, miraculously conceived a child, and a very special child. The angel Gabriel appeared to her husband, Zechariah, who was a priest, and told him that he and his wife were going to be parents of a very special child, a child of promise, that they would give birth to the one that we today know as John the Baptist, the one who would come to prepare the way of the Lord the one who would come in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare God's people for the coming of their Savior. Now, Zechariah and Elizabeth had never before been able to have children, and in that day and age, that was a really big deal. In that day and age, a woman's whole worth And value was wrapped up in her being a wife and a mother. And Elizabeth couldn't do that. And so we can imagine the bitterness that she had to fight off. We can imagine the shame that she must have felt, the gossip, the stares, the pitying looks that she got all of her life because she couldn't do what most of the women around her could do. But now, now in her old age, now finally she is pregnant. And she's pregnant, she knows, with a son. And what a son, right? Even with all of the downsides, even with morning sickness and back aches and the swollen feet and all of that, it must have been over. She must have nurtured such an incredible sense of joy. And folks, I know that today, if a woman is pregnant past the age of 35, it's labeled a geriatric pregnancy. Isn't that a lovely term? A geriatric pregnancy. I've had a few friends who were very offended by that on their record. And yet they also told me that there's a big difference between a pregnancy after 35 and a pregnancy before 35. Folks, if anybody had a geriatric pregnancy, it was Elizabeth, right? And yet, even with all of that, I can only imagine her giddy with delight at her condition, smiling down as she watched her belly swell for the very first time. We can only marvel sometimes, can't we, at how God chooses to fulfill his will among us. But then Luke goes on to tell us about another miraculous pregnancy when Mary conceived Jesus. And this time we're at the other end of the age spectrum. Mary was probably a teenager, perhaps around 14 or 15. That's the age that girls were generally betrothed. Mary was betrothed to Joseph, meaning she had a legally binding relationship with him, but they were not yet fully married. She was still a virgin. And Gabriel then appears to her as well and says, do not be afraid, Mary. That's almost always the first thing an angel says when he appears. Do not be afraid because, I don't know about you, if I see an angel, I'm going to be afraid, right? Do not be afraid. You have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great 
He will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary asks the question that all of us would want to ask in that situation. Um, how, how is this going to work? Because there's something that hasn't happened yet, right? There's something that usually happens before a woman conceives a child, and that hasn't happened yet. So how is this going to work? Mary asks a question not about whether or not Gabriel is telling the truth, she's just asking a question of logistics. And Gabriel answers, well, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Okay, that makes it abundantly clear, right? While that doesn't really explain anything at all other than God's going to do it, Mary basically replies, it says, I am a servant of the Lord. Actually, it says, I am a slave of the Lord. I belong to the Lord, so may it be to me as you have said. It's amazing obedience that Mary shows here in the face of incredible circumstances. But it's at this point that Mary then hurries that 50 to 70 miles from Nazareth down into the hill country of Judea to go and visit her relative Elizabeth, the only other woman in the world at that point that would have any idea what she was going through. And here's what amazes me. Elizabeth doesn't get jealous. Think about it. This had been, up to this point, for the first six months of her pregnancy, this had been Elizabeth's big moment. Elizabeth had been the special one. Everything was finally coming up roses for Elizabeth. After a lifetime of shame, after decades of praying and weeping and longing, finally, Elizabeth was going to have a baby. And what a baby, the forerunner of the Christ, the one who will prepare the way of the Lord, the one who will come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And then here comes Mary, and she's got a miraculous pregnancy too. And she's going to have a son as well. And what a son. Only this time, Mary's going to give birth to the actual Christ, the Savior, the Messiah. Am I the only one standing here thinking, gee, Mary, you're stealing Elizabeth's thunder, right? You couldn't wait three more months until she had the baby before you swooped in and sucked up all the attention. Really, Mary? but that's not what happens. Because Elizabeth humbles herself and welcomes Mary and uses this opportunity to worship the Lord. We're told when Mary arrives, she greets Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth hears the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord." Elizabeth worships, but notice it's not just Elizabeth who worships here. Baby John the Baptist worships in the womb. 
In fact, it's pretty amazing to think that John is the first human being to worship the incarnate Jesus. He does so as a baby in utero, a baby leaping for joy because he's in the presence of his Savior, who is also in utero. If that doesn't say something about what God thinks about life in the womb, I don't know what does. But then Elizabeth joins in. The baby leaps in her womb before Mary has a chance to say anything. She's just said hello at this point. She hasn't given any explanation. She hasn't told the news of what has happened to her. She hasn't mentioned the angel or the pregnancy or anything. And Elizabeth joins in and worships as well. She worships the one who has given her and Mary the gift of these babies. She humbles herself because in the end, Elizabeth recognizes that it's not all about Elizabeth. It's not about Elizabeth being the big cheese. It's not about Elizabeth having her moment in the sun. It's not about Elizabeth getting her time in the limelight. Elizabeth doesn't magnify Elizabeth. Elizabeth magnifies the Lord. And Elizabeth recognizes the Lord has graciously given her and her kinswoman Mary an incredible gift, a gift of grace. Listen again, why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? What humility, right? What humility. She recognizes it's all about what God is doing in this moment, the grace and the mercy of God and the gift that he is giving to them and to the world. And we look also at Mary's humility and Mary's worship in this moment as well. Now, I recognize that as Protestants, we sometimes get a little uncomfortable when we talk about Mary, because so much has been made of her by our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters. And while, yes, I disagree with calling Mary the Queen of Heaven, I don't see that anywhere in Scripture, while I disagree with the doctrine of her immaculate conception and the doctrine of her perpetual virginity, again, I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. And while I really have a problem with calling her co-redemptrix or praying to her, again, I don't see anything about that in Scripture. Still, I want to make sure that we don't go so far in the other direction that we don't talk about Mary at all that we basically ignore her because we're afraid of going too far. These passages are put here for us as a gift. And what we see here is like her kinswoman Elizabeth, Mary humbles herself. She doesn't magnify herself. She magnifies the Lord. Just look at the song that she sings usually called the Magnificat, my soul doth magnify the Lord. It's all about God and what God is doing for her and for the world. This isn't about Mary. This isn't a song all about, look how great I am that I get to do this wonderful thing. This is, look at how great God is, that He is doing this wonderful thing and how amazing that I get to play a tiny little piece in this. And the whole song really is about how God brings down the proud and lifts up the humble. God brings down those who magnify themselves, and He honors and He blesses and He lifts up those who humble themselves before Him. Mary and Elizabeth knew that, and they practiced that, and they lived it, and look how they were blessed. And folks, that pattern still holds today. God brings down the proud, and He lifts up those who humble themselves before him and magnify him, make him big in their lives. And I would submit to you today that we have even greater reason today 
to humble ourselves before God and to magnify Him than Mary and Elizabeth ever did. To quote Mary's Magnificat, the mighty God has done great things for us as well, and holy is His name. And we know so much more of the story than Mary and Elizabeth did at this point. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the prophecies. They knew what God had promised to do, and they knew that He was beginning to fulfill those prophecies through them and through the sons that they were going to give birth to. That's why they humbled themselves themselves before God and lifted him up. We know, however, what came about after they accepted their role in God's plan. We know that baby John the Baptist grew up to preach and to teach and to baptize in the desert, and that he prepared many hearts for the coming of the Lord. And we know that Mary's baby grew up to preach and to teach and to do all kinds of miracles and to deliver people from demonic possession, and that eventually he would have Roman spiked nails driven through his hands and his feet as he was nailed to the cross for our sins. We know that on the third day he rose again from the dead. We know that he is coming again. And in the meantime, we know he is right here, right now with us, Emmanuel, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we know that he hears our prayers and he answers them. And we know that he enables us to understand his word to us in Scripture. We know he works and he moves through the sacraments. He's promised that he will do so. And above all, we know his love is everlasting and his power to bless us and to transform us is greater than we can ever imagine. And because of all of this, we are called today to humble ourselves before him and to magnify him, to lift him up, to exalt him, to praise him, to make him big in our lives. And so many people resist that, especially this time of year. So many people want to make this holiday season all about themselves. Sometimes they want to do it through the presence, either by being the perfect present giver. Have you ever met the perfect present giver? They always give thoughtful presence, insightful presence, generous presence, beautifully wrapped presence. They show their specialness by giving the best presence, and everybody exalts them for being the best present giver. And then there are those that it's all about the presence in the other way, right? It's all about who gets the biggest presence, the most presence, the most expensive presence. Look at how important I am because of this haul of loot that I have gotten this year for Christmas. I must really be special. I must really be loved. Look at all of these presents that I have. For others, these holidays are all about having the perfect experience. It's the magical experience of the holidays that are important. It's all about our family coming together wearing perfectly matched Christmas jammies as we stand around the piano with steaming mugs of cocoa or eggnog or hot cider or whatever, and we eat perfectly baked Christmas cookies and sing candles as we gaze into the fire and remember the glories of Christmases long, long ago. These wonderful things are the things we'll remember all through our lives, right? These are the folks that can never come to worship because Christmas is all about family, right? Because Christmas is all about the children. And I can't humble myself enough to maybe rearrange my schedule to make Christmas about God because it interrupts my time with family. And that's what's really important. I'll wear a button that says, Keep Christ in Christmas. But I don't really mean that. Not if it's going to intrude on me having the perfect experience the perfect dinner, 
the perfect time opening presents, the perfect whatever. Mary and Elizabeth show us here, Christmas is about humbling ourselves and magnifying God and receiving all that he has to give to us. For the mighty God has done great things for us and holy is his name. For the mighty God has humbled himself for us by becoming a baby in a manger and ultimately by growing up to live and to die and to live again for us. Will we let this season be all about him or will we insist that it's all about us? Let's bow before him. Let's worship Christ, the newborn king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To him alone be the glory. Let us pray. God, we are so grateful that you humbled yourself that you might lift us up. We pray that you would help us to humble ourselves and to magnify you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.